there's a new thing, has everybody heard of OBIE, Oracle Business Intelligence Enterprise Edition? That's where a lot of the data warehousing business intelligence uh, uh, focus is for Oracle right now. But they still support Discover, they still support forms and reports and portal. They're not going to give any of those things up, so you don't have to worry about losing uh, any investments that you have in those technologies. And then the other things that I mentioned, OBIE, uh, Oracle Business Intelligence Enterprise Edition, identity management, absolutely huge for uh, a lot of large organizations right now, keeping track of all the security, who has privileges to see what application. You don't want to have to have it set up so a user has to log in to every different application, every different portal, every different thing that they have to see there. Uh, identity management is an incredibly powerful tool that allows you to set up rules across your entire organization for users and what they can see. It also makes it really easy when someone gets promoted, they get new privileges automatically, they leave the company for whatever reason, you can revoke those privileges from the application. Uh, <coughs> a lot of the identity management features that are out there was through, again, one of Oracle's acquisitions, right? They purchased Sun a couple of years ago. Sun had some incredibly powerful uh, enterprise identity management tools. Oracle has incorporated all of those different things into its offering right now. There's also a web tier module. If you want to use uh, web logic as kind of just a plain old HTML application server, nothing really fancy, uh, the web tier uh, managed server allows you to have a lot of really sophisticated capabilities that go along with that also. We'll take a look at each one of these in depth as we go through. And then we'll have a summary right at the, uh, at, at the end. And again, if anybody has any kind of questions, uh, I tend to get excited about this stuff and talk really fast because there's a lot of information to get out there and I know I have a relatively short period of time so if I start talking too fast and you have a question I don't mean to skip over anything just raise your hand and I'll, I'll try to get into it as quickly as I can. So what is middleware? If we take a look at the history of the application architecture that developers have worked with over the years uh, the first era from the 50s kind of to the 80s was the dumb terminal era, right? We're talking about really dumb terminals, and they call them dumb terminals because the actual terminal that end users worked with didn't do any processing. It was strictly a conduit. You had a, a big web server, a, a big uh, a, a server somewhere, and that would pump all of the information. And the actual interface that the users used, again, didn't do any processing whatsoever. So the biggest issue that we had with that was that there was absolutely no scalability whatsoever. If you had an application and you designed it for five people and you went to 50 people or 500 people, uh, you had real serious problems trying to change around how the application was architected so that you could support all of these new users that were out there. Uh, in the second era, in the 80s and the 90s, we started really going into client-server type applications. And what this really meant was that the client that the end user was working on did some of the processing. We were taking a, a burden off the actual server and saying, okay, let's do some of the processing. Let's do some of the validation when their users are inputting data. We could do it right there on the client, whether it was a PC or a Macintosh or whatever we were, we were talking about. We could do some of the processing there. When we wanted to display information, if we had a graph or a chart or something like that, the PC could actually do some of that work and we could take it off or we could take some of the work off the, the, the server. So we, uh, we uh, helped it with our scalability. We were able to do more and more with the scalability because the PC was actually doing more of the work, but we were locked into the operating system. So if I developed a forms-based application that ran on Windows, you were kind of locked into that. You didn't really have a lot of flexibility in terms of people saying, okay, well, now I want to run this on a Mac. Now I want to run this application on a, a Linux client or something like that. So we were locked into the operating system. And we also had the problem of distributing distributing our application, right? Every time there was a bug fix, every time there was an update, if I had an organization that had 5,000 end users, I had to go to 5,000 different PCs and update the application. We also had the problem, uh, and of course, there are management tools that allow you to do that automatically, but there was one more layer of things that you had to go through. And we also had the problem of, especially in the early 2000s, what were the odds that everybody inside my organization were running the same operating system? Right? There was a point where in the early 2000s where you probably had people running Windows 2000, Windows 98, Windows 98 ME, uh, Service Pack 1, Windows 95. You had all of these different versions. So even if you standardized on Windows inside your organization, it was still a challenge to get all the different pieces working together. You were missing DLLs, you had a different version of the DLL, you had to distribute all of these different pieces together. So the client server here helped us out a little bit but there were still some challenges that went along with that. 
In the 2000s, we started seeing this thing called three-tier architecture. And the three-tier architecture really said, okay, we're going to have this third tier kind of in the middle. We're going to isolate our database or our data source. We're going to have another <coughs> tier in the middle that serves up our application. And we'll have our end users access that application through, usually, a web browser. Once we had that web browser in place, we got rid of being locked into the operating system. Because in theory, this wasn't always true, but in theory, it didn't matter if you were running Internet Explorer on a PC, if you were running Safari on a uh, Macintosh, if you were running Firefox or Opera on a Linux operating system, in theory, you should be able to get to the application and get it running. Now, we all know, of course, that isn't true because Firefox put a whole bunch of stuff in there. Microsoft put a whole bunch of stuff in Internet Explorer. Everybody tried to reinvent the wheel and put their own things in there. But in theory, we, we should have been able to get away from uh, being locked into the operating system there. The distri distribution of the application updates became relatively simple, right? We have one place where the application is. We have a bug fix. We put it on the application server. The next time the user logs into the application, they have a new version of the application with the bug fix or the enhancement or whatever it is. So uh, we're starting to get a little better, but we still have some scalability issues. A lot of the early web servers that were out there, you couldn't cluster them together. You still had multiple single points of failure throughout your network. If there was uh, a break between the web server and the database or the data store, that could break down your whole application. Obviously, if your application server went down or your web server went down, uh, there were still some problems there. What we're moving towards now is an end-tier architecture. And an end-tier architecture just means that kind of at that middle layer, we can have a whole bunch of different servers. We can scale out vertically. We can scale out horizontally if we need to do stuff like that. So in this type of environment, what are we talking about? We're talking about really isolating the database, the data store, uh, the, completely from the application, completely from end-user interaction. That allows us to tune the database and the database server with it an inch of its life. The end-tier architecture where we have all of our um, business logic and all of our validation logic, again, we can scale that out, we can cluster those different pieces together. And again, that allows us, uh, gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of scalability. And then the client, again, here, we really don't care how they access our application. They can access our application through uh, the different browsers, different operating systems. What's the huge thing now, right? Mobile. Everybody wants to get, grab things on their iPads, on their iPhones, uh, on their uh, Android devices and everything like that. So we have this entire new class of client type applications that could be accessing uh, the information that we provide to them. And with this architecture, it gives us a lot of flexibility of being able to do that. With new application servers that are out there, they're smart enough to talk, to, to figure out, to determine how am I accessing this application? Am I looking at it through a browser? Am I looking at it through a mobile device? Uh, there's an exciting new technology uh, called jQuery Mobile. Has everybody heard of that? Uh, there's a, a, one of the tools supported by Oracle. It's called Oracle Application Express. I'm assuming everyone's heard of that one, right? Uh, the new version of Application Express is going to support jQuery Mobile right in uh, natively inside the development tool. So uh, you're, you're smart enough to figure out, oh, somebody's accessing this through an iPhone or an iPad or something like that. You can reformat your page and see it there. Uh, in a real nice format that fits on your iPhone instead of looking at looking at it through a traditional browser. Excuse me. So again, this architecture gives us the flexibility to say, you know what, I don't know what's coming in the future. Five years from now, all of this technology might be uh, obsolete. We might all be wearing Google Glasses, for all I know, and we'll be accessing information through that. Has anybody seen that Google Glass demo? That's a little creepy. That looks a little Star Trek to me, where you actually walk around with the glasses and then you know you can look at a building and get all of the Yelp uh, information from the uh, from the restaurant and everything like that. But who knows? I mean, five years from now, that's how we might be all accessing information out of the internet. There may be brain implants. You know, no nobody really knows how this is going on. But this type of middleware, this end-tier architecture, gives us the flexibility of saying, okay, how are we going to access information in the future? And we can do all of these things relatively easily. It's a lot more complex, there's a lot more moving pieces, and we have to understand how all of those pieces fit together. And uh, fortunately, that keeps us all employed, right? The people who want to get data to this uh, information and the businesses who want this flexibility are going to need people like us to actually implement them. So hopefully, it'll keep us employed for a long time. But it's a little more complex to set up and make sure that you have all of these pieces in place uh, to provide this type of functionality.
So we've talked on, uh, we, we've hit on some of these things already. Why middleware is so important. Platform independence.